Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, uh, wherever you are in the world. Uh, International Human Rights Commission, as you already know, they're celebrating uh, the March as a month of our Today, we are having a very dynamic young leader. She uh, was uh, the deputy, first ever deputy minister of interior in the government of Afghanistan in the very youngest age. The critics has uh, criticized on her appointment, but she showed her resilience, her determination for the women and future of Afghan women. She uh, stood stand with her determination for the peace, for education, for empowerment of a woman, and uh, she was uh, uh, none other than uh, Miss Husna Jalil, the first ever Afghan deputy minister uh, in the government. We are welcoming uh, the Excellency Minister. Uh, although uh, you are a very young and very uh, resilient. Uh, the floor is yours, Madam Minister. Thank Uh, we might having a some uh, in, uh, we might having a uh, some uh, internet problem. Uh, I think uh, uh, I think your excellence, you have having a little bit uh, internet problem, uh, but you can go ahead. You can go ahead. Um, I'm told that actually based on we have as we environment I or the working Excellency, do uh, uh, Excellency, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Uh, do you are uh, hearing me? Uh, are you hearing me? If you are hearing uh, me, Mr. then Khan, can I reconnect in a few minutes? I need to change yes. my uh, router. No problem. No problem. Uh, we perfect. are live here. You perfect. can just change it. Yes, perfect. Ladies and gentlemen, let me uh, read it some uh, something about the, the minister. Uh, she is uh, again. I am uh, uh, making it uh, the clear for all of you. Uh, might be you all know about her, but Hosna uh, uh, Jalil is the first Afghan woman ever appointed as a high interior ministry post in Afghanistan. She was appointed on the first, uh, 5th December 2018. Jalil was graduated from the American University of Afghanistan with the master degree in business and management. Uh, when she was appointed as the deputy minister for interior, uh, the critics uh, and uh, so-called journalists has uh, criticized her appointment 
and uh, this this was the uh, this was when she was appointed but she showed her resilience she uh, showed in the uh, the power of a woman in the age of 26 when she was uh, just appointed uh, and uh, even uh, the reaction on the social media and everywhere uh, was the uh, god dim when she becomes uh, uh, working into the in the portfolio she is not only uh, a one minister she is now heading uh, the peace security uh, women empowerment education and uh, she is the uh, she is the uh, advocate of the youth empowerment as well uh, it is uh, very much uh, clear that uh, her education her background her uh, uh, experience now is in full of uh, determination dedication for the afghan women she is uh, uh, a one of the uh, young lady who is following the path and dreams for having a women in afghanistan more secure more powerful and uh, more uh, active into the politics uh, as well <clears throat> while she is joining uh, uh, in shortly uh, we will be uh, able to talk to her to listen to her that uh, what's her ambitious what's her targets uh, ladies and gentlemen afghan pakistan is an uh, edge of uh, crisis always because of the uh, non state actors uh, today afghanistan is struggling and thriving uh, for the peace prosperity economic growth unity solidarity so this is the uh, the at this moment the, the afghanistan so uh, madam minister is here and uh, we uh, want to listen to her uh, her struggle her uh, inspiration and uh, how she is motivating today the women of afghanistan to work for the peace prosperity education economic growth in afghanistan uh, madam minister you are here or listening Yes madam minister you are here and uh, we are uh, we are very happy to uh, to listen you so that uh, i had made my statement on your uh, appointment on your education on your career uh, little bit so the people should understand that who is in front of them Uh, i would always call that you are become a symbol and a uh, uh, iconic inspiration for the girls in uh, afghanistan to move forward with their dreams and without any limits as we say that there is no limits in the sky so madam minister floor is yours Uh, thank you so much. I'm repeating myself. It's such a great pleasure and honor to be uh, here today and connect with the uh, friends, with the fellows, with the uh, I don't know if, if the audience is only from Pakistan or other country. Uh, but to anyone who is listening to us today and who is who has participated today, and I'm looking forward to have a more engaging session today. Uh, I'm Hosna Jalil, as Mr. Khan has uh, introduced me just a few minutes ago. And I'm told today actually to talk about the challenges that women face uh, 
uh, in the work environment. But I would love to connect those challenges, the work environment challenges or the working challenges to the social and family challenges to a woman as well, because that is where the challenges start and that is where a woman starts struggling. Uh, what makes me sad or upset, I would say, is because uh, the environment or the overall uh, access to resources at the same time, the rights given to a woman is not equal to a man, while it should be, being two, um, I mean, equal human beings. But at the same time, what makes me happy is because the challenges in Afghanistan for a woman is not a very uh, different one. I mean, those are the challenges that we share in common with many, many women in many, many other countries. There are not much difference uh, in terms of the, the nature of the challenges and the level of the challenges between uh, women in different nations. And this, I mean, the common challenges helps us in order to connect, in order to um, uh, come up with, the, with a quite similar solutions, I would say in a much um, comprehensive, but at the same time, collective approach, having a collective approach for that. Um, but at the same time, to look on the bright side of it, it, it helps us in order to um, to feel each other, to understand each other, and to share the, the common emotions with each other. So if I may start from Afghanistan, the, the challenges, I would love to start at the challenges from um, the very, uh, I would say, uh, first days of, of a life of a girl child. The challenge starts with the um, different views a family has or, or a parent sometimes has towards their um, uh, girl child or the, the boy child. The rights given to them, the limitations put on, on a girl child compared to a, a boy child. Uh, giving them access to education, that is one of the biggest struggles a girl child has to deal with. In order to get the right to education, but then later on to the higher education. But then after that, once we are coming to the social environment, of course, uh, social environment, there are many, 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 uh, I would say, uh, um, issues around the women's issues or around the surrounding a, a teenage girl, I would say. Uh, the chief has to deal with it. And those uh, challenges are coming from the social barriers or the social limitations put ahead of a girl child or a, or a girl teenage. There are so many uh, social issues from the world. Uh, the youth or this disability is sometimes from the woman's side too, because that is how the they are trained, or that is how they themselves have lived, and that has become unbelief for them. And this little teenage has to deal with all those social challenges as well to get to, I would say, to, to speak, to get the freedom to represent herself, to get the freedom to define herself beyond what the, how their parents or the, them or coming back to the um, limitations or the barriers that, that, that society is putting in front of a, a teenage girl. But then with all these, I mean, struggling with all these uh, barriers and challenges and coming back to a work environment and getting after uh, getting the right education or the, the right training or skills, whatever they have coming to the work environment. What happens to women having the equal access to resources that has been a dream in many, many countries. And I think it's still a, a common challenge between all the women, among all the women across the world. The levels are different when it comes to equal access to resources. The levels of di are different, but uh, the nature is the same. Some countries are, are struggling for equal pay. Some countries are struggling for much, much basic uh, resources. So that is still there. But then when we come to the bigger uh, challenge, the bigger challenge is not because a woman can struggle. It's not because a woman, uh, uh, I mean, can't work hard. It's, it's not because a woman can't be productive. They are equally productive to a male colleague or, or a male uh, counterpart. They are equally um, efficient or effective in an institution equal to their um, uh, male counterpart. But it depends on how uh, the, the mentalities are set around the productivity and around the efficiency of a woman. A woman has to prove herself while a man ha doesn't have to prove herself. Uh, at the same time, a woman has to work harder than a man to prove herself. While on the other side, if we look at the other side, she has to work longer hours in order to prove herself. While on the other side, if you look at the social responsibilities, the family responsibilities of a woman, 
it is, I mean, we find it quite unfair to expect a woman in the working environment or the professional environment to work twice or three times or four times, four, four times. Uh, more than a man uh, than than a male counterpart, but on the other side, if you look at the social responsibilities, she has to be or the family responsibilities. She has to be a good mom. She has to be a good cook. She has to be good at uh, taking care of the house or the household. She has to be good at uh, a good daughter-in-law. She has to be a good sister-in-law. She has to be a good daughter, a good sister. There are so many social responsibilities that are um, somehow it's taking the time of a woman at the same time. It's it's taking energy. But on the other side, we are expecting on the work environment as well, not to work equal to a man, but just because she is not proven or no one accepts her, she has to work harder in the work environment as well. But what, and in return, what a woman is receiving, that is, um, uh, I think, some, sometimes discouraging, but at the same time, sometimes uh, it is encouraging a woman in order to have that guts to, to be resilient or to um, some, somehow to uh, change the mentality. Uh, and that is when you're not accepted to in, a, in an environment, um, sometimes a woman will receive the, the uh, most harsh behaviors as well, to an extent where she, she can be called a prostitute for, for uh, going out or for, for having a social presence or having a professional presence. So that these are what, what a woman, to that extent, what a woman can receive. Or maybe harassment, sexual harassment is part of it, of course. But at the end of the day, I think the, the, there's a long way for the women to go because uh, when it comes to the social or professional uh, uh, presence of, of a woman, if we look at the history, women's presence socially and professionally, it hasn't been as, um, historically, it hasn't been as long as uh, the male uh, counterpart. Do they have been, but the, the history has not recorded those uh, presence, or the, the history has, in a way, is not has not written the, the effectiveness of, of women in the uh, society. While for men it has been a generalized concept, but for a woman we have role models. It means there has not been number of women. I mean, a huge number of women. But for for the men it, it has been generalized. It has been some something common. So that is why um, I would say. Uh, at the end, that the women's fight, it's a good fight. When it comes to women's uh, fight for equality, when it comes to women's fight for uh, equity at the same time, when it comes to um, women's rights, equal rights, but I would say it is a fight to be won, but for, I mean, for the, for the sake of not women, but for the sake of humanity, for the sake of equal rights to, to human beings. But at the same time, I would say it is a good fight. Not for us, but it is a good fight for, for generations to come. And do that generation is actually not only the little girls who are coming after us or the, the generation after us. It's also for those little boys as well uh, that either we have today or maybe tomorrow we will have them. We also have to set those mentalities around those uh, future men as well. So that's why I would say I have to repeat myself that it is a fight, but it's a good fight for the next generations of humanity, not just the next, the next generations of women. Thank you so much. Over at my end. Thank you very much, Excellency uh, Minister. Uh, very brief statement you have given uh, to the audience, those who are watching on the Facebook Live. Uh, I will say to uh, the people, those who are watching live, you can put a question and we will ask on your behalf as well. Although uh, we have our own questionnaires uh, to the Honorable Minister, uh, <clears throat> I want to know uh, what want to hear the wise of uh, women of Afghanistan from your side, is that uh, the peace process is going on. What are the reservations of the uh, young generation, especially the women's uh, uh, in Afghanistan, into that peace process and what uh, the outcome of that peace process, Honorable Minister. Well, if we're talking about the peace process, then there is one uh, common view between two categories, and that is the young generation of Afghanistan, the youth and the women of Afghanistan. Fortunately, they both are uh, having the same stance. In terms of uh, the peace process, the expectations around the peace process, and what how, I mean, what the peace process should bring to them, because end of the day, it's not just a matter of women, but the young generation of Afghanistan—they own this country. 
they own the peace process and they will be the foundation for the sustainability of this peace process. Uh, so far, the Afghan government um, is um, highly committed in order to have the women's rights and the um, uh, the achievements or the progress we have made towards uh, training our next generation that we call them our youth, uh, they've got the, the rights of these two categories as, as their red lines, particularly when it comes to the children of Afghanistan. The Afghan government is highly committed and at the same time is very sensitive to, to the rights of the children and um, eliminating violence and harassment against the uh, children. So what the peace process will bring, of course, it's a two-side negotiation with intermediaries, with middlemen. Uh, but I, I can only speak on behalf of the Afghan government and from the Afghan government's perspective. And that is uh, that the Afghan government has set the rights of women and youth and children particularly as their red line. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, uh, there are uh, so many things uh, going on, on on the social media. Uh, about the peace process and the and the future of the peace process. Uh, obviously, uh, being as an, a member of the cabinet, you know about all the, uh, the talks uh, going on uh, into the media, social media, and as well as the voices of the many partners uh, from the women's side, from the girls' side, especially from the youth side, as, and they are uh, very much uh, uh, having a concern uh, over the things which is going on. So would you like to elaborate uh, that uh, the outcome uh, will be uh, will be as per the expectation of the young generation because the young generation is a force for any country for the development, for the economic growth and for the prosperity. So what you think that uh, uh, I mean, obviously, you are also in charge uh, of a women empowerment ministry. Uh, so, what will be your thoughts and your response on it? Uh, in that, uh, the, but the uh, the women's and particularly the youth of Afghanistan should uh, consider the outcomes. Well, when it comes to the expected outcome, um, I can't say we won't be. When there's a negotiation, of course, uh, there has to be compromises at both ends. But when it comes to the youth right, the youth right or the woman's right is not in the basket that is open to uh, compromises. I can't say to what extent, like how the definition would be, but end of the day, when it comes to the expected outcomes of the peace process, uh, one thing is clear. Women and youth of Afghanistan, children, I, I mainly consider children, the children of Afghanistan, they are not in the negotiable basket. Their rights are not negotiable. If that is negotiated, there is no sustainability in that peace process. There is no peace, actually. Uh, Excellency Minister, uh, this is the, uh, we had raised the concern about the peace process and the rise of the youth, uh, but uh, uh, because uh, uh, as the March is a month of a woman, I mean, it belongs to the women. Uh, I always say that every day is a woman day, uh, but unfortunately, the world is not uh, yet to be ready to celebrate every day for the women day. Uh, hopefully, the someday will come when uh, the women's and men's will be uh, alongside each other will celebrate every day for a women day. I want to ask you one question. What are your greatest strengths uh, behind uh, your achievements and behind your movements and behind that you uh, reached on the ministerial level uh, from a common guy to the minister? So what you feel that what is your greatest strength behind your all successes and your all uh, struggle? Okay, there are two things. The first one is uh, I don't consider a government employee an uh, uncommon person. We all are common people. And it is even, I would say, holding a government position, it is a public servant position. So we are basically serving the public. And for us, 
uh, I mean, when it comes to the governance, to the right governance mechanism for us, the citizens are the king and we are serving them. Uh, but when it comes to uh, my trials, whatever, whenever, whenever I'm, I'm signing up for a mission, I do it based on two things. First, does this mission inspire me at all or not? Do I learn something from my mission or not? And the second thing is, does it speak my values or not? I'm having a set of my values. I never cross those values. I never sign up for something that is not speaking the values. So whenever I am, no matter what level that is, for me, the level of the responsibility has never been a matter. But for me, it depends like what I'm delivering and whatever I'm delivering, are, are those deliverables aligned with my uh, values or not? Am I achieving something personally? And that personal achievement is, is uh, less of a capital achievement, but it's more of a spiritual achievement. Uh, so what makes me satisfied, it's, it's not a matter of where I am, but it's, it's a matter of how satisfied I am with, with uh, my missions or, or with my services. But what makes me satisfied is, again, the achievements I'm having aligned with those values, the values that I've got, my, my very personal values that I've got um, uh, set for myself, but at the same time, the values that I consider them as a very uh, bold part of my identity. Excellency Minister, I want to uh, mention it that on your social media post, just on the Noro's day, uh, you had uh, posted that uh, with your sister and with your uh, great mother, that they are the basically a greatest strength behind your all uh, struggle and you get inspired from them. Just let us know that how your mother uh, been a very instrumental for your achievements uh, till today. Uh, I will respond to this very briefly in one sentence. And that is, my mother has been the one whenever I've failed, whenever I've uh, decided to give up on something, particularly when it comes to a fight, to a good fight, she has been the one telling me, you just need to, ch you don't have to change your fight. You just need to change the way you're fighting. She is reminding me every time that I'm close to giving up. She's the one reminding me of, uh, this is not something you can give up. Or this is not something because this is your value. So I just need that reminder most of the times whenever I am deciding or I am in a position where I have to look into uh, my priorities or into um, the fights that I'm picking or the struggles that I'm having. She is the one reminding me of the importance of those struggles. She is the one giving me a better picture or the, the uh, broader picture of, of how it can affect you or the failures that you have. So one of the reasons I'm, I'm saying she has been there in order to um, make me a re resilient person is because she keeps reminding me why I'm fighting, why it's important. Uh, and she has taught me indeed that there's nothing called given up, giving up. If you give up, you just lose it at the beginning. Uh, it's, a, it's a very good advice for all the young generation. At least they are inspired. They should get inspiration from their uh, great mothers because the mothers are always a role model for every child on the earth. I, mean, I think that if there is no mother, then, then the, the, the earth will become a like and a hell. So obviously every child look toward the inspiration to their parents and especially to the mothers. Uh, Honorable Minister, uh, there is a, uh, one question that uh, when you uh, feel pressure, and stressful. Obviously, when you become in 26 years, uh, I think it was the last year when you uh, you uh, uh, took oath as a minister. So, in the in the very young age, when you took the, uh, the oath, and there was a widely criticism uh, on on your appointment. Uh, as an interior, a deputy interior minister, obviously the interior minister is a very powerful job in any government. Uh, so, 
uh, how you deal that pressure and stress uh, and how you uh, come up with that uh, pressure and to uh, to look your way forward well when it comes to coming up with uh, or, or coping with the pressure or stress of the job i can't say i wasn't stressed because my stress was coming from a point where i had to remind myself every single day that there is no way to give up or there's no way to fail it uh, and if you fail, you're failing on behalf of a generation and you're just being unfair to a generation, not to yourself. The stress was coming from that part. But, uh, no matter what was my age, first, I, I got appointed at the Ministry of Interior more than two years ago, two and a half years ago almost. Um, for me, I had learned to look into things, to, to step back, to look into things in a very calm and relaxed manner. And at the same time, to take my job serious, but not to rush a thing. So that was something that I had learned long time ago. But at the same time, if you compare an Afghan woman or an Afghan citizen, even sometimes, particularly when it comes to women, it, it's a more a common uh, definition for the women of Afghanistan. They start taking responsibilities at a very young age. You can't compare the responsibilities of an Afghan teenage to an, a, a teenage in the Western countries or the developed countries. They grow up at a very young age. They, they become mature at a very young age. If I look into the life of a 10 years old girl, I can immediately tell you that she is living the life of a 30 years old lady, woman. Considering the responsibilities she is taking at, at the very young age, uh, I would say that is, of course, a child. A child doesn't have a childhood. It is something which is, uh, I mean, which is quite absurd. But at the same time, if you look how uh, quick they they grow up and how quick they become, they become a mature person, in terms of taking more responsibilities or heavier responsibilities, that's not something um, uh, I would say weird or odd in Afghanistan. That is that is quite normal. Honorable Minister. What you uh, consider and describe the role of a woman uh, into the uh, uh, climate uh, change? I mean, you know that the world is facing at this moment the climate change on a worst level. And uh, across the world, uh, mostly uh, the young uh, leaders, I mean, the young people are leading the, uh, the advocacy campaign. Uh, what you uh, describe the role of Af Afghan youth, especially the women, uh, into the climate crisis advocacy, and uh, what you think uh, that the uh, Afghanistan can pay uh, the uh, highest level uh, on the climate change? Uh, ob obviously, the Afghanistan is also facing the climate crisis, and uh, how you? Uh, elaborate all the things uh, together. Mm -hmm. Well, when it comes to the uh, climate change, the Afghan women, they have been indirectly involved in saving the environment or protecting the, uh, protecting the environment. But when it comes to having a loud voice in terms of protection of environment or climate change, uh, the Afghan women did not have that loud voice. But this year, 2021, we are organizing that um, uh, united voice of the Afghan women for the um, climate change, or, or as I would say the environment protection. That is one of the priorities for this year we have. But end of the day, considering the, the, um, uh, their, their role directly or indirectly in terms of the, the saving the, this, this planet or saving the environment in practice, that is something which is much more bolder than the, um, I mean, much bolder than the male counterpart. Uh, but they haven't been in, in an organized uh, campaign. Honorable Minister, uh, there is a one more uh, thing that uh, education play a very vital role into the development sure. uh, and growth of any country. So what do you think that uh, where you uh, see the Afghanistan uh, into the education, especially the educating the girls uh, and investing into the girls' education uh, in the next five years? Well, in Afghanistan, uh, when it comes to the education, we have come a long way. 
when it comes to, uh, I would say, if we go back to uh, two decades ago, if we go back to the beginning of the transitional government we had after the Taliban regime, uh, considering that no girl child had access to a proper education, they were not allowed actually by law. But today, if we look into the numbers, into the percentages of uh, girls or women's access to education and to higher education, that is a big achievement, I would say. But end of the day, if we look into how many a girl child, or uh, it, it's not just a matter of girl child, but it's it's a matter of uh, the, the overall children, like boy child and girl child, who does not have access to uh, education. In five years, uh, we are expecting in order to provide access to education and every single call the government is, is uh, aiming. And the priority will be the um, girl child, the, the girls. Thank you, Minister. Uh, we have, the world has seen okay, that uh, uh, the education institution been demolished, uh, education institution been uh, burned, uh, and the, the girls was barred for getting education and going into the schools, colleges, and uh, in the in the past, uh, I'm mentioning the past history. Uh, obviously, uh, the present government of uh, President Ashraf Ghani is moving forward, uh, trying to uh, hard uh, to moving forward for investment in the girls' education. Uh, I think that. Uh, uh, the what you are expecting from the international community to play their role into the girls education into afghanistan because it is directly concerned to your ministry well when it comes to the uh, international community and the or the international partners of afghanistan particularly and the regional uh, countries um, afghanistan i can say um, but Afghanistan's development is region's development. Afghanistan's development will be world's development. And it's not just Afghanistan which will be affected in case there will be any sort of conflict or any sort of um, uh, challenges or struggles. It is affecting, of course, the, the entire human beings across the globe. So, and if Afghanistan is, of course, developed, and if the human capital of Afghanistan is developed, of course, it's it's gonna the benefit the benef main beneficiary is gonna be many other countries, not just Afghanistan, starting from the neighboring countries to the regional countries to the uh, international community overall. So, what will be their role is the first one to have a un unified, I would say, voice. Any country can have their own interest, but end of the day, uh, they need to put together like what is what are they the common interests for us and how we are supposed to be benefited from, from a specific cause. And the good causes, I would say, and the great causes that we have, the humanitarian causes, should not be victimized by the political agenda. I think what the international community and what the regional countries can do, not just for Afghanistan, but for themselves as well, is to uh, Uh, to have a red line between the humanitarian and like over excellency uh, gender equality is an surging across the world and obviously uh, the people say that this is a man-made world uh, I am not uh, having a difference of this opinion, but uh, what your ministry is taking the step uh, for the gender equality, gender piracy, and uh, especially uh, the violence against the women on the workplace and in domestic level, uh, because it is uh, this matter related to your ministry and your job. So uh, I want to know that what steps have been taken, what step isn't, uh, will be taken into the uh, future, and uh, what is the roadmap you uh, had set uh, to, uh, to address these all issues in Afghanistan? 
when it comes to the gender equality, I would say in Afghanistan, we have to improve gender equity first before we come to gender equality. The second one is uh, if we want equal, I would say, participation and equal partnerships and equal rights to the Afghan women and the Afghan men, we need to provide an equal access to services and equal access to resources. And that itself is, is paving the way for further equality or the equality in terms of partnership and participation. We need to provide equal access to education, equal access to healthcare services, equal access to uh, shelters, to, to uh, food security, to employment, equal access to employment, equal access to justice. That is one of the biggest challenges, not for Afghanistan, but for many, many other countries because the justice system is somehow dominated by, by a male, by men. Uh, so if, if we, I mean, the, the approach we have for, for Afghanistan in terms of improving gender equality or promoting gender equality is to provide, to start pro provision of equal access to service and resources. And the access to service and resources is something that the government, of course, is not just influencing, but is managing it. So whatever is under control of the government, we can improve. We can start improving the situation with the resources or the decisions that is under our own control. So access to service and resources, one of the best areas that we are approaching this year in order to uh, promote equality through service and uh, resources. Uh, gender parity, if we will see the uh, index into the world, your country is not even on the uh, the 25 percent of the gender equality into the women in power. Mm -hmm. So, what your ministry is suggesting to the His Excellency, the President of Afghanistan, to take step uh, to make it the uh, gender parity into the cabinet from the cabinet level to the grassroots, uh, because it is very essential if until and unless women are not a decision maker, we cannot uh, uh, get the harmony uh, into the society for a, for a gender equality. Because uh, as you said, gender, uh, you are looking toward gender equity. So I am saying the gender uh, parity, uh, which is most essential, it comes from not from the grassroots, it comes from the upper side always. Because the upper side is always the role model for the for the lower levels. So how the president uh, of Afghanistan will address uh, this issue, I don't think that the president himself is a very visionary and uh, very open-minded person. Uh, I have uh, been listened to him many times uh, in person as well. So what you, what you think that uh, your ministry is suggesting are moving to the uh, to the table to the president uh, in this regard? Well, when it comes to the president, uh, one of the biggest priorities for the president of Afghanistan is developing the Afghan women as part of the human capital of this country. Uh, and those, pro I mean, it is being prioritized based on the second um, uh, Afghanistan's National Peace and Development Framework, NPDF, the second version of the, the document. But how do we, um, I mean, how do we take bigger steps towards improving or developing the Afghan women? Uh, I can say today after just two decades, because uh, during the Taliban regime and the civil war, the Afghan women has reached to the zero status in terms of their participation, their contribution, their partnership, at the same time to have access to services. There was no equality, of course. There was no humanity, I would say, um, humanitarian even behavior toward women. So uh, the Afghan women, they started from the scratch, in the, in, I mean, 19 years ago. It's not just two decades even. But today, 28% of our civil servants are women. They're, they're delivering civil services. 11% of our decision makers are women. 11% in just 20 years, starting from the scratch, starting from zero, is um, an incredible, I would say, um, a percentage. And in most of the cases, Afghanistan is an example to most of the regional countries. And it's not a symbolic nomination or symbolic role of women. They take their, their responsibilities, 
with passion and dedication and that they are equally um, uh, i would say uh, efficient uh, to their male colleagues or their, their male counterparts so if we look into the numbers if we look into the quality of those numbers as well afghanistan is um, i mean in, in just two decades we have got great progress but that progress has to not only be sustained but at the same time to be uh, and be invested in those pro uh, progress to be continued there's a long way to go of course but in just two two decades, Afghanistan is still, in some cases, a good example for many other countries. Uh, I hope uh, that uh, this uh, level will reach from the 11% to 50% soon, and uh, your country will be all uh, included into the uh, index of the 18 countries, which are having a 50% uh, gender parity into the federal cabinets uh, of their countries. Obviously, your nomination shows uh, the commitment of the Afghan leadership uh, to empower the women uh, with equality and uh, with the, the power of decision makers. Uh, Madam Minister, there is a one, uh, one thing uh, which we have to also uh, discuss that uh, uh, today the there are so much voices that uh, the UN Secretary General should be uh, given the role to a woman. Uh, what do you think if if there is a woman uh, in charge of the UN United Nations? What impacts will be uh, UN can make? Uh, on the world and to the countries towards the women empowerment and what uh, how the women how the women leader can lead the uh, uh, the united nation more effectively uh, than the man leader but uh, what, what's your remarks what's your what's your take on this uh, question which is raising across the world now well, if, if, if we could have a UN Secretary General, a strong woman, uh, I would say with a great vision for the world, um, then I would say she will be much, much, a woman will be much, much more effective than a man because, not because my gender is, is the same, it's, it's not because of my own gender, but because I found women uh, more value oriented, I would say. Uh, and whenever they, they take a responsibility or they, they make a commitment, they are much more value oriented towards that. And they consider a job like a cause for themselves most of the times. So if we could have a competent, uh, um, strong woman with a great vision for the world, she is going to be much, much uh, efficient and effective and productive as well for the entire, um, uh, I mean, for, for all the international nations. Uh, my and question proven, actually, we do have some proven examples too, um, including some of the top leaders, women leaders in, in, in around the world, and how they have managed different crises. I mean, the they, they have uh, their crisis management skills or the, uh, the, the how they have, they have strategized different, uh, I mean, in, in different case scenarios, and including uh, struggling with COVID or um, I would say countering COVID. Uh, 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 effect on the uh, on their nations. I think we do have some really good examples, and we do have a good justification why a woman can can serve much better than a man in that position. I am asking you one uh, question uh, that will be uh, where you uh, see yourself in a five years or ten years being as a woman leader. Well, I, if I may, um, um, if I may be a little bit bold here, I never overplan my life, neither my my, my career um, life or professional life or my personal life. I don't overplan, but at the same time, I'm not someone who can wait what life brings for me. I'm not someone who 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 waits for for the life um, to to bring anything for me. So I would say all I want personally, all I'm planning to do in the next five years is to be able to serve the children of this country. 
I've had a great uh, honor of serving our national defense and security forces. Now I'm having the, the big honor of serving our women, but I'm expecting to have the, the uh, opportunity to serve the, the children of, of the Afghanistan because I'm considering think, them the future human capital. Do you think in next five years or next 10 years, uh, there isn't any chance to be women as a president of this uh, Republic of Afghanistan? Well, I can't say that that's impossible. Of course, that's not impossible. There will be challenges for the women in order to nominate themselves in terms of, uh, uh, there will be, of course, challenges compared to a, to a uh, man or to a male counterpart. But that is, of course, not impossible. We, do, we used to have great women, but at the same time, we do have great women so far. And I'm sure there would be one day that we will have, I can't say either in five years or 10 years, but in the future, I'm sure there will be uh, many, many women to compete, no matter if, if they want, win or not. But for me, what matters is to have more of, of uh, women to be candidates for, for presidency. And I'm sure we, I'll witness that. Inshallah. I have one question. We do question. have that political one. knowledge. We do have that capacity. We do have that strength in our women. And I'm sure we do. We would witness that. I think that if the Afghanistan will be having a female uh, president uh, or a premier, so Afghanistan will be also in the club of the South countries, those who are already having an, uh, the female head of the states or governments. Uh, but anyway, uh, I have a one more question that uh, do you have an idea to uh, bring the women leadership in Afghanistan uh, to witness the uh, Afghan uh, prospectives uh, towards the achievement, uh, uh, whatever the recent interest, recent to uh, a one decade your country has taken up for the women? Uh, I mean, uh, do you have any planning to call any international summit into our uh, international conference on the women empowerment in Afghanistan in the future or in our coming days? Yes. Just after the we ending of pandemic. Planning, we are in the planning to, um, at this point in time, we are planning two summits. One will be the regional country summit on, on the Afghan women. The other one will be Islamic country summit on the Afghan women. So they both will happen in 2021 by end of 2021. So they will, they both will happen in nine months. Uh, let me, let me assure you on behalf of the International Human Rights Commission, whenever you will be having in that uh, conferences, uh, our highest level delegation uh, will be uh, over there to strengthen your efforts for the women empowerment. Uh, Madam Minister, Thank you. Uh, I, I wish that our organization and your ministry will uh, also uh, elaborate some sort of uh, uh, working for the, uh, to investing in the, in the women's and girls' empowerment, uh, not only in Afghanistan, but also taking the Afghan lead, Afghan girls uh, and the women's leaders on the international forums. Uh, so we, we, I assure you on behalf of the International Human Rights Commission, whenever your ministry will uh, make this decision okay, that uh, you want to send uh, the representative on our international forums, uh, International Human Rights Commission will sponsor and even collaborate with you to have a wise, a women wise on international platforms uh, from the Afghanistan especially the youth of Afghanistan and the women of Afghanistan. Madam Minister, at the end, while we are going to uh, end uh, this live talk with you, uh, I want to ask you that uh, what will be your message to the young generation of Afghanistan, and not only Afghanistan, across the world, that how they uh, should be resilient, determined, dedicated, uh, towards uh, their uh, goals, to achieve their goals. Uh, but as, because your word will inspire, you are the, uh, the, the most youngest minister and I have searched many things that might be there is some more younger than you, 
but you are the youngest ever minister uh, in the world at this moment as well so uh, there are very young member of parliaments from the 20 year age but none of them was the minister so uh, what is your words and your message uh, hopefully your message will go loudly to the people of world especially to the youth of world the floor is yours ma'am uh, thank you so much uh, i would like to conclude our conversation with responding to this question actually which is uh, uh, which is a very, I would say, a privilege for me actually to respond to this question because I, I, I know there will be a lot of, there might be in the audience, there might be a lot of uh, many, many great youngsters among the audience who, if I would ever meet them, who will inspire me actually on a daily basis. Uh, so all I want to tell them is I want to make two recommendations or two advices from my, my side, because this is something that I've learned at a very young age and someone else has taught me actually. And I want to pass them, pass it to them because I've experienced it. The first one is to define themselves beyond the name which is given to them, beyond the nationality given to them, beyond their, their parents' name, beyond what do they have in terms of the, the capital resources? They got to define, I mean, as, as a youngster, we need to define ourselves. And the definition should cover our values too. Uh, and we should never let anyone else to define our identity. It is really important because our identity is beyond our name, is beyond our passport, is beyond our national identity, is beyond our parents' name. There are so many uh, aspects to our identity that we have to figure out who we are. And this is the biggest question that every single one of us has to uh, respond to this question every single morning when we wake up. The second one is we are often told as, as a young generation, we are often told that it's not our time. And the opportunities belongs to our previous generations. So I would say, it's okay sometimes that we are struggling for opportunities to prove ourselves. We should start learning to create opportunities instead of grabbing opportunities, instead of looking for opportunities. I keep finding so many youngsters. When I was, uh, when I stepped into my professional life or when I opened the first chapter of my professional life, I didn't start it with government. I started it with the private sector. And that was when I myself created an opportunity for myself. And I can't say my, my parents were so rich to support me. This should be the first question everyone can have. Um, like my, my, our parents are not as rich as they can support us financially to start a business, but my business uh, was not much, much based on the capital, uh, the, the initial capital or the initial investment. It was much more of the idea. So that's why I'm saying, uh, we should stop running around for opportunities to prove ourselves, for opportunities to keep ourselves busy. We should always think of how we can create opportunity. Because even the opportunities we are talking about or opportunities we are looking for or we are running after, those opportunities are created by someone else. So why we shouldn't create opportunities? So that we, not only for ourselves, we create opportunities, but also for many others, for tens and, and hundreds of others. We create opportunities. But lastly, I want to mention, don't go for an opportunity, don't go for a job, don't go for a mission, don't go for responsibilities just because you're earning something. It is good to earn. It is good to, of course, to, to have a, a revenue generating source. None of us can, can survive without the financial aspect of our jobs. But to have our values aligned with those responsibilities, to enjoy every single moment we are delivering based on those values. Otherwise, we are just holding a seat. And we are just wasting our life, literally wasting our life, because as much as we are spending, at least from, based on my experience and the experience of my fellows, we are spending more than half of our lives in our professional circles. And the professional circles is there, or the professional environment is there in order to deliver something for the nation, for the government, or for, for the public. Uh, and that is why we got to pick something that is not only helping us in order to earn something, but also something that is uh, or a responsibility that is speaking about our values, that is inspiring us, 
that makes us deep, deep and at the same time internally satisfied of what we, whatever we have achieved or delivered. Because that is not only going to be deliverables that we're delivering to the institution or to the environment that that is that has hired us, but also we are having some some sort of personal achievements too. Because we have achieved something that is that we have dreamed of achieving it that is based on our value. So that is something that gives us energy every single day. So if I were ever be in a position to advise anyone based on the advices that I've received long ago and I've experienced it. Three things, I'm repeating myself. First, define your identity. And that should go beyond what you have. Don't let anyone else define your identity. Second, don't look for opportunities, create it. And the last one, never ever sign up for something that is not, um, that is just a revenue generating source for you. Go ahead with something that is giving you multiple aspects. And that is both. Uh, but that is, of course, revenue generating as a revenue generating source plus that is speaking your values, that is inspiring you, that is, that, that is making you satisfied internally. So that is what I would ever advise if I would be in a position to advise, actually. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Uh, uh, the three things, uh, identity, uh, resilience, and uh, decision making, three uh, advices that the youth of a world has been taken. I was looking at the social media, more than 14,000 people are watching you uh, at this moment. And uh, I don't know uh, from which country, but across the world. Uh, I, I hope that uh, the dream will, will come true for the peace in Afghanistan. International Human Rights Commission always supported the peace in Afghanistan, not only for the for the region or uh, for the world, but we think that the Afghan Afghan peoples has paid a lot price of the uh, controversies, regional and internationally, and now it is uh, a time that the Afghan peoples should be given the chance to decide their own fate without any interference, without any conspiracy, without any uh, uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, we want that Afghan people and Afghan uh, women uh, must be prosperous. They must be like and prosperous and having a life like in other countries. And uh, I wish that uh, very soon as the pandemic will end, I will visit uh, Afghanistan myself as well uh, to uh, show our solidarity uh, with the people of Afghanistan, with the women of Afghanistan, and definitely in a, uh, as the pandemic will allow, we will invite you into the third World Youth Summit uh, to address uh, the international gathering and along with the international leaders. Whether you are a minister on that time or not, we don't consider it, but we will invite you as a wise of a woman of, uh, and youth of uh, Afghanistan into that summit. So thank you very much, Madam Minister, and God bless you, God bless the people of Afghanistan. And uh, we uh, made uh, this commitment to you and uh, you are already committed with the people of Afghanistan and the women of Afghanistan. So let the, the way forward for the peace and prosperity for the whole of your nation and to the international community. Thank you very much, Madam Minister. Thank you so much. I'm Ladies and gentlemen, I'm having the pleasure of being here today. Thank you, Madam Minister. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are listening to the, uh, the Deputy Minister and the first ever youngest female minister of Afghanistan. She, uh, she has given you uh, the youth of our world. Uh, you should be resilient. Uh, follow your identity. Follow your own dreams. And don't give up. These are the message of the Afghan minister for you. And she is somehow a minister, but she is a fellow of your ages. So 
see that how resilient and dedicated she has turned her life to be a successful role model for all of us. We will see you soon tomorrow uh, again with the one more uh, story with, with the one more resilient woman. Uh, until then, God bless you. Take good care of yourself wherever you are. Goodbye to you.